today is titled Revere, Receive and Run, or it could be called The Warrior, The Warrior and the Thief, or The Arrogant, The Anxious and the Oblivious. Um, I need to tell you about three people in scripture to share this message with you. And the first one is Uzzah, who we read about in 2 Samuel 6, verses 3 to 7. Then they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals, because they were bringing the ark of the covenant back to the city of David. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. I remember reading this story as a teenager and being horrified, <laughs> thinking the poor guy, he was only trying to help. But the thing is, Uzzah didn't get it and his arrogance cost him his life. The ark had been in his father's house for some time. Google tells me 20 years. He'd literally grown up with it. Um, some of us, if we grow up under the presence of God, we can take it for granted. Undoubtedly, the ark was blessing everything around it because scripture tells us this is what it did whenever it was with God's people. Uzzah should have understood its power, but he didn't. The Bible records that he was struck down because he didn't show due reverence. He didn't understand the power of the gift that God's ark, his manifest presence, offered. Uzzah's mistake put reverent fear into King David, however. He refused to take the ark home, instead sending it to Obed-Edom's house for three months. Obed-Edom got it. He received the ark willingly, and the Bible records that everything he had was blessed because of this. When David heard about that, he got over his fear pretty quickly and arranged to bring the ark, the gift of God's manifest presence, home. The second person we read about is Martha, and she's over in Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. Many of you, I think, know her story really well. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha didn't get it. Here she is trying to feed the guy who told his disciples in John 4, I have food you know not of. And when they wondered together who had brought him a sneaky snack, he added, my food is to do my father's will and finish his work. That is the work of restoring his precious people to relationship with him, repairing the bond broken back in the Garden of Eden. It follows then that the best way Martha could have fed Jesus in that moment was to sit at his feet and receive from him. And if she had, Jesus would have fed her. Mary got it. She saw past Jesus' humanity to his divinity and realized that he had what she needed. In this, she showed due reverence. No wonder Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better and it won't be taken away from her. The last person I want to tell you about is one of those thieves. Flash forward to the th two thieves on their crosses beside Jesus in Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. One mocked the gift and demanded, as the Message Bible tells us, some Messiah you are, save yourself, save us. The other one got it. Have you no reverence for God? We deserve this, but not him. Then this second thief asked for what he needed most. I think I might have struggled to do that while watching Jesus strive for breath beside me. I wouldn't want to be a bother. But my assumption that I'd bother Jesus is itself a kind of arrogance. No wonder Jesus told us to be like little children, coming boldly to our loving daddy God, that good, good father we sang about with our arms outstretched, asking for what we need, confident that the father who loves us will give it. This second thief didn't struggle, as I think I might have, even in that moment going breath 
for tortured breath with the Messiah. He saw Jesus as he truly was and he revered the gift. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, Joseph Prince has said, unless you can receive from God, you have nothing to give to man. Without the humility and wisdom to receive God's gifts of salvation, we have nothing, period. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us our righteousness is as filthy rags. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, by grace we are saved through faith, and this is a gift of God, not of works, so that no man should boast. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so the all-surpassing power revealed is clearly of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If we receive his gift, we get everything we need. As Aaron was just saying, we get blessing, we get healing, we get relief from suffering, we get purpose, we get power, we get the whole shebang. But if we can't receive his gift, if we like Uzzah, trust in our strength more than his. If we, like Martha, get busy doing as we see fit instead of sitting at his feet and listening. If we, like that first thief, mock and demand, why God, why, when God, when, instead of humbly owning our limitations and asking for what we need, we miss the moment. Our encounter with the divine, our opportunity to receive what Jesus has for us and to allow Jesus to fulfill his divine purpose in giving us that gift. Every great move of God has begun with humility and repentance. This is how it works. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we hear God's voice. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray as Aaron preached about so beautifully the last two times he's he's brought the word to us seek my face turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven forgive their sins heal their land in this passage God is telling his people in a good time a time of closeness when they've just finished rebuilding the temple under Solomon and entering into deeper communion with him in this good time God is telling them this eternal principle for how to reattune when their hearts stray and communion is this for us now as often as we do it a reattunement a remembrance of who he is what he's done what he's given us that brings us back into alignment with him. This is what God is asking of us too as we take communion together today and every time we take it, to come back into alignment with him, to put down the ark, the mop, the insult, to stop trying to convince ourselves or other people that our striving matters a jot or that our filthy rags are righteousness, to repent and humbly accept his marvelous gift. There comes a time for service, but don't put the cart before the oxen or reach out your hand to steady anything on it. Um, first, revere. And if like Uzzah or Martha or the first thief, you missed it, don't worry, you can repent. Then receive the incredible gift of God's power and presence with you, in you now and always, even to the end of the world, as Matthew 28, 20 tells us. Then and only then, you'll be ready to run into everything God's called you to do. Revere, receive, and run. Luke 24, 49 says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Acts 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So I want to ask you, if your heart is touched today by God's call to reverence and repentance, if the Holy Spirit's pressing on your heart, as he has been on mine this week, calling you back into attunement, into alignment, into connection with him, if 
you want to repent of having missed your moment of letting something or anything or anyone get in the way of your connection with Jesus, would you do something brave with me? Would you declare yourself? Would you stand as we take communion together and would you pray with me? Lord, we get it now. We've been out of alignment with you. We want to reattune. We want to revere and receive before we run. We humble ourselves before you now. We want to be connected to you. We want to receive all that you have for us. Please forgive us, please forgive me, Lord, for the ways that I've missed it. I turn away from those things and I choose you today. Please draw us close to you. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for healing our land. Let's eat and drink together. Father, we thank you for your body and your blood. God, you are so magnificent. There is no one like you. Father God, we give you all the honor and all the praise. And Lord, we just take a deep breath in your presence today. Father, you are worthy of our time, our attention, our affection. And God, we don't want to put one foot out of step. As Katie reminded us, Lord, let's not put the cart before the oxen. Let's not lead ourselves, but let's allow you to lead our lives. Every area, may you be the preeminent one. May you be our singular priority in life. May you be the only one that we pursue. God, we worship you. For there is none like you. You're a good, good father. Perfect in all your ways. And we honor you. In the name of Jesus, we all said amen. amen and amen. Please take your seats. Need you to buckle in because we're going to go through the quickest church life announcements in history because I want to get to one of my most favorite things that we get to do and that's a baby dedication in just a moment. So hold on, everyone ready? Church life, reach out 4,000. Give us a wave if you know what on earth that is. If I get enough waves, only half waves. Reach Out 4000 is the vehicle in which we, and we go into the community. So at the moment, it's three things. It's clothing, food, and essentials. And so we've been asking for your support in that. And thank you for your generosity. We have two brand spanking new freezers. So thank you for that. One replacing an old one and one building some capacity. Thank you for your generosity. It was overwhelming. And the other thing we were uh, asking your contribution for was linen and bedding and towels and what have you. The, the needs of the support we provide to the various domains and community are shifting and changing. And so we wanted to be able to provide real, practical, actual support. So thank you for financially donating that way. So if you can still think of a chiller bag every time you go to Coles, that'd be awesome. We see them slowly trickling in and it's beautiful because as soon as they come in, they go out again. So thank you for considering adding that into your grocery shop. We really, really appreciate it. They can be dropped off at the info desk. Um, there's a, there's a pull-up banner which says, reach out, drop off point. So it couldn't be any clearer. So thank you for your giving in that way. Water baptisms. Everyone excited about that? I'm excited. So we're going to have the tank here. So where, where Ken is and, and where, Matt, where, where these lovely people are here, you won't be there in a couple of weeks' time. We're going to set up the pool. We're going to have it in worship. We're going to celebrate together. If you've never been water baptised, you don't know what water baptism is, it's for you. So come and grab one of us at the end of the service at the info desk, or you can email us at info at thechristianchurch.com.au and it will be our honour to walk you through what water baptism is, the importance of it, 
and the fact that we get to participate in a, in a public expression, the death and the resurrection. We get to be dunked. We'll hold you down there sufficiently and uh, you'll come back up again after the third bubble reaches the surface. I'm just kidding. So if that interests you, you didn't get a chance to do it with us last time, we would love to do that. Come and grab one of us at the end of the service, head to the info desk or email us. Just get your details to us. We'd love to, uh, to partner with you in that way. Pre-service prayer meeting, it's growing. The team are growing. There was probably about eight or nine there this morning. Please come and pray with us before the service. Prayer shifts things. It changes things. And we pray from 8.45 to 9.15. And the focus is you. So come and pray for you. No, come and pray for everybody else. We pray for a move of God to come. We pray that we would have hearts that are ready to receive from Him. We come and pray for the city. We come and pray for whatever it is that God places on our heart for, for this day. So if you'd love to come and pray, it'd be an honour for you to join us 8.45 to 9.15 here, down in the service, and uh, come and join the team and pray in that way. And there's no coffee barista today. Oh, but there is self-service tea and coffee, so you can still get your caffeine hit. It's out in the outdoor cafe area, or maybe take someone out for coffee afterwards. That's a good idea, but there will be no cafe today. So Sue, wherever you are, we pray for healing over your body. You were meant to be on holidays, but God bless you anyway. I pray that he would refresh you and restore you. And finally, I want to thank Andrew and Ray, Ray Scobie, wherever you are. We don't have uh, a roof that looks like Hiroshima anymore. Thank you, Lord. The panels are going back up. The, the auditorium looked like Hiroshima during the week. There was pews everywhere and stuff all over the carpet, but we, we made it. We did it. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ray, for loving the house and serving in that way. It is an absolute blessing. Let's prepare our hearts to give today. Thank you for your faithfulness. It shouldn't have made sense over the last two years, but God's hand of blessing and protection and provision has been on this place financially and in every other way. So as you prepare your hearts to give, let's just pray today. God, we give because we know that we cannot outgive you. God, we give of our time, we give of our talent, and we give of our treasure. And today, Father, we're mindful that your word says, give cheerfully, give in faith, give knowing that as we honour you with our finances, as we honour you with our possessions, we will reap a great harvest. And Lord, it is not a doctrine to give and to get, but that is just the blessing as we trust you with our finances, as we, as we pour, the, as we bring as it was in Acts, we, we put the money at the apostles' feet, God, to extend the work that you do. I thank you, God, that you will bless this house. There have been many words spoken over this community of believers that we will be a house that knows how to steward wealth well. And so, Father, those who are trusted with the small will be entrusted with the large. So, God, we hand it to you. Father, I thank you that we have a God-fearing, Spirit-led board that govern and lead and, and seek you about how we spend. We make sure that we're being compliant. We make sure that we're being thrifty and honouring and there's no waste and there's no gaps and there's no overlap. God, we give you all the honour and all the praise. And we ask, Lord God, that you would remove any blockage any blockage from financial breakthrough in people's lives, Lord. We trust you, Father God. You know what we need before we even ask. So God, we boldly and humbly ask that you'd bless us so that we can be a blessing. Thank you for divine health. Thank you for giving us a new talent, giving us a new skill, Lord God, that we can bless others with. And we all said, amen and amen. God bless you as you give this morning. Well, can we welcome the Swain family, Cat and Randall? Zion and Sienna and Jackie and Micah, if you want to come too, that'd be a beautiful thing. Do you guys want to stand up on here? I'll get out of the spotlight. It's all about you and this precious baby today. Look at her. Isn't she so cute? You are beautiful. And I think you know it. Yes. We have the privilege of standing with Kat and Randall. Today, as we dedicate Sienna and Grace Swain, we welcome family and friends who are here today to celebrate with the family and Zion, her amazing brother. This precious gift came crashing into our world last year on the 6th of October, 2021. That's a good month to be born on the 1st, so 1st of October. 
There is no greater gift than the birth of a new child. And today we acknowledge God's sovereignty over this precious family. In the Bible, God tells us that children are a blessing. And sometimes we've got to remind ourselves of that. And a gift. Their spirits are filled with innocence, aren't they? Joy and laughter. Jesus actually tells us this is how we should approach Him. Full of faith, full of trust, totally dependent on their dad. Just like this one is right now. Just as children need discipline and correction in order to stay on the right path, God tells us in Scripture that we are His children and He corrects us as a father. God wants us to succeed and have a future of hope and success, just like we want to see for our own children. Proverbs 22.6, a familiar passage to all of us says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and in keeping with his individual gift or bent, when he is old, he will not depart from it. I love how the message translation puts Jeremiah 29.11 to 14. I know what I'm doing. Thank you, Lord. I have it all planned out, plans to take care of you, not to abandon you, plans to give you the future you hope for. When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. When you come looking for me, you'll find me, little one. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree. We're called to lead our homes and families that fear the Lord, We are mandated to know intimately and to stand on God's word and we must live authentic lives of worship, cultivating an atmosphere that attracts the presence and the peace of God. Cat and Randall, today we stand with you as your church family as you raise Sienna, this precious gift. We we will celebrate with you in the triumphs and the challenges of this mystery package called family. We'll rally around you and support you, whatever is necessary. Today, you are presenting Sienna before God, asking for grace and for wisdom in carrying out the privilege and responsibilities associated with parenthood. You can have full confidence that with God, you will steward this precious gift well. You will. You are the right parents for this amazing gift. God sees your desire and your commitment to each other today and to your growing, incredible family. You can take comfort in what Psalm 139, 15 to 16 says. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Church family, let's stretch forward our hands. Let's pray for this precious couple. I'm gonna ask Jackie to pray this morning. Can I hold? I'm going to touch the baby. I'm sorry. I love this family. Oh, Jesus, you are a good father. You are the best father. You are the greatest father that ever lived. I thank you, my King, that you love Sienna more than all of us. And we love her so, so much, my King. I thank you that you placed her on this earth for this time, that you have placed a destiny and a purpose in her that's bigger than we can even imagine. I thank you, my King, that as she grows, I thank you that you are with her, that she will hear your voice, my King, that you will be closer to her than a brother. I thank you, my Lord, for this precious child. I thank you for the things that we can't even conceive that you have got planned. And I thank you for your protection over her. I thank you that every plan that you have for her will come to pass. I thank you that you will make her way straight and her path clear, my King. And I thank you for that you have placed her with this family, that you have given her to Randall and to Kat and to Zion. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have placed the manual for her, Lord God, with you and that you have given her parents that will seek it out. I thank you, Lord God, for Randall and for Kat, that they seek you out, that they, Lord God, are attentive to your voice and to who you are. And I thank you that as they train their children in your ways, I thank you that you will see that and that that is faithful.
I thank you as they, Lord God, seek your face over the best way to raise this precious child. I thank you that you are faithful and that you will shape them, Lord God, into who you want to be for your glory. I thank you, Lord God, that this little girl is for your glory and your kingdom, just as this family, Lord God, shines your light to everyone that they come in contact with. I bless them, my King. I bless their marriage. I thank you, Lord God, for Randall and Kat's marriage, that it will be stronger than ever. I thank you, Lord God, for the connections that they make with each other and with those around them. And I thank you that you have placed people around them to speak your truth and your life into their life and to Sienna's life. We give you all the glory and the praise. I thank you, my King, that you know what you're doing. And we trust you and we just adore you. And in your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. There's a small gift. There's a certificate to make it all legit and a prophetic, a prophetic word over her life. So God bless you guys. We love you. We appreciate you. It's just too good, isn't it? Just makes you all gooey. Makes me all gooey anyway. We're done. We are done. We've had three. three oh, sorry, Mike has had three. We're, we're done. Can we stand as we read the the scripture for today's word? We stand to honour the word of God today. So sorry for the yo-yo, up, down, up, down, but it'll it'll be fine. You'll be okay. Galatians 5 from verse 1 to 6. We're going to read from the Passion Translation today. Do yourself a favour. Go grab a Passion Translation. It's amazing. If you're struggling, it's a bit dry, your word experience at the moment, go grab one. At last we have freedom, for Christ has set us free. We must always cherish this truth and firmly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. I, Paul, tell you, if you think there is benefit in circumcision and Jewish regulation, then you're acting as though Christ is not enough. That's a bit of a rough one, eh? I say it again emphatically. If you let yourselves be circumcised, you are obliged to fulfill every single one of the commandments and regulations of the law. If you want to be made right with God by fulfilling the obligations of the law, you must cut off more than your flesh. You have cut yourselves off from Christ and have fallen away from the revelation of grace. But we have the true hope that comes from being made right with God. And by the Spirit, we eagerly wait for this hope. When you're joined to the anointed one, that's a pretty cool phrase, hey? When you're joined to the anointed one, circumcision and religious obligations can benefit you nothing. All that matters now is living in the faith that works and expresses itself through love. Amen. Let's welcome Ken as he comes to minister the word this morning. Thanks, Pastor Aaron. And thanks again for trusting me with your pulpit. I was actually preparing a message on um, the faith of Jesus and having the faith of Jesus until I read Galatians chapter 5 and I ran into verse 6 and went off on a rabbit trail and that study got bigger and bigger and bigger until it became this morning's message so the other one will have to be part two but I was struck by that verse that says when you are placed into the anointed one and joined to him circumcision and religious obligation can benefit you nothing all that matters now is living in the faith that is activated and brought to perfection by love. The King James, which I usually read, says, faith which worketh by love. The Amplified says, faith activated and energised and expressed and working through love. And I thought, I'm studying, love, I'm studying faith and here's a verse which explicitly tells us this is how faith works. I need to find out a bit more about this one. And... It says love is how faith works. It's how it's activated. And the Bible declares in many places that that we're saved by faith. There's Galatians 2.16, Romans 3.22, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. You know them. But in Galatians 5, Paul defines the nature of that that faith. Saving faith is a living faith faith in a living saviour. And it's not an intellectual belief. It's something we... We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. 
It's not something we do, it's not a religious practice, but it's an active trust that surrenders control of one's life to Christ's leadership and continues to follow him in obedience. It's so alive, this is from one of my commentaries, that it can't avoid expressing itself in love-motivated actions. And verse 14 of the same, 13 in the same chapter says, by love serve one another. Verse 14, love your neighbour as yourself. And the great thing about it is this isn't a love that we've got to work up ourselves. The guys under the Old Testament, the Hebrews, they were told in Deuteronomy 6.5, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and none of them could do it. Because the Old Testament told them what to do, it didn't give them the power to do it. But in the New Testament, 1 John 4.19 says, we love him because he first loved us. Love, our love is a response, our love for God is a response to his first love for us. 1 John 2.3, 1 John 5.3 says the evidence of that love is that we obey his commandments. I'll just read 1 John 2.3. Now by this we know, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We do something, but it's a response. And it's not the cause of our salvation. It's not how we get born again. It's a response to his love for us. Faith is always a response. Faith always has a response. It has corresponding actions. And James 2, 14 to 20, I'm sure you all know, says... The difference between intellectual faith and faith of the heart or just knowing something in your head and believing something in your heart. One's dead and one's alive. And you can tell because one's got actions and one hasn't. For verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you don't give him the things that he needs for his body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And James isn't telling us to do an introspective search of your history and, you know, how much, uh, you know, what of, what's my track record of works or what's my track record of love? Can I measure if I'm really saved? No. He's contrasting faith of the heart and an intellectual decision of the head. And faith can never be an intellectual decision. Faith is of the heart. And we've studied that before where we mix the word of God with faith in our hearts. We speak it out of our mouths and then it's the sword of the Lord. Then it has power. Because your head, yes, your head's got a lot of power. You know, your head, your brain is a very useful tool and, and the more educated it is and, and the more you know the word of God, the better. But knowing about God is not the same thing as knowing him in your heart. And 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labour of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over again, I started to look, I did a search, online bowl's great, you can, you can do a search for, for words and it comes up with every time those words are within this many verses or whatever. Faith and love turn up all over the place, together. Real faith of the heart has actions and the first action is a response to God's love that drew us. Real faith isn't a sentimental, a sentimental feeling. It's a robust confidence. And it's built on the fact that God is love. And we say, well, is faith... Well, I'm a word man. I, faith is based on the word. Yes, but Jesus and the word are one. Jesus was the word made flesh. God, Jesus and the Father are so completely one. And God is love. I often say when I'm preaching elsewhere that pul pulpit's normally made out of timber and I say, it's like this pulpit. Take away all the wood and what have you got left? Absolutely nothing. God is love. He just doesn't love, he is love. So saying that faith is based on the word or saying that faith is based on love, 
I believe, is interchangeable. God's love is the foundation and it's the cornerstone of faith. Don't let experience be the cornerstone of your faith. I've seen so many people who, who just fall away because things happen in life. You know, sometimes we don't know why things happen, but we live in a, we live in a world. Let the word of God be a foundation because the word of God doesn't change. Ephesians 3.17 says that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. If you want to be filled with the fullness of God, in other words, get rooted and grounded in God's love. Rooted and grounded in God's love sounds like uh, you're not going to get moved away from it real quick. It sounded like you've, sounds like you've got a living revelation in your heart. And a revelation of his love results, this scripture really says, in being filled with the fullness of God. Amplified says that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you might be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God, may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. Passion Translation says, then you'll be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions, how deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love, how enduring and inclusive it is, endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. That's the love by which faith works. That's the love that we can depend on. One, uh, John 17, 21, I've probably used this passage almost every time I've preached. I just love it. Um, Jesus is praying and he prayed that all, may be, that all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. If we're one with him and filled with the fullness of God, we're going to radiate that love because what? Faith is a response. Faith has a response. And our first response is to the love of God. The world may know that God sent Jesus. The world will know that God sent Jesus when we get a revelation of that love because it'll, it'll just ooze out of us. If you want to be filled with the fullness of God and grow strong in faith, if you want to reflect Jesus, get a revelation of his love and how he's filling us. Ephesians 1.22 says, And put all things under his feet and gave him to the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of, sorry, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Passion again says, And now we, his church, are his body on the earth and that which fills him who is being filled by it. And that means that as we are complete, completed or filled by Christ, he's also completed and filled by us. And that is an awesome thought. That, that's just amazing. Jesus isn't complete without us. Thinking, that's a bit over the top, isn't it? <laughs> It sort of blows you away for a while, but in the same way that he fulfills and he fills us, we fill him. And that, that just, it just boggles the mind. The New, New English Translation note says, who is filled entirely by the church. King James says, the church, the fullness of him that fills all. We're not a side issue to Jesus. You know, we're not just something that he does in his spare time. The church completes Jesus. We, the church, complete Jesus. And that is just an unbelievable thought. It's amazing. Colossians 1.19. Whoa, I've just gone somewhere else. Didn't bring my paper back up. Colossians 1.19 says, For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. And then chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 says, In Jesus dwells all the fullness of God. And we are complete in him. No wonder we have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The fullness of God is in Jesus. And Jesus lives in us. And we're completely one with him. 
We're not a side issue. You know, God's, God's plan of salvation, over and over again in the Bible, it says that it was set up before the foundations of the earth. Revelations 13.8 says the Lamb, Jesus, was slain before the foundations of the earth. You think, how can that be? You know, the world, world wasn't made. He wasn't killed until, you know, 4,000 years later. No, when God decides something, it's done. It's a done deal. When he says something, it's a done deal. So the scripture says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth. 1 Peter 1.20. If I can tap this right. says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest to you in, the, in these last times. Ephesians 1.4 says, Just as he chose... It, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. Titus 1.2 in, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Ephesians 3.11 says it was God's eternal purpose. From eternity past, it was his purpose to be one with us. We're not a side issue to God. Isaiah 53 says he intercedes for us. 1 Timothy 5.15 and Romans 5.8 says that even we were sin still sinners, he loved us so much that he sent Jesus. Hebrews 12.2 says the joy, for the joy of seeing us, for the joy of being in fellowship with us, he went to the cross despising the shame. Hebrews 7.25 says he now ever lives to make intercession for us. Ephesians 2.4-7 says the reason that we are saved and seated with him in heavenly places. Actually, I've got to read that. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you are saved and raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ. So that means we read that from before time began, God planned our salvation. Jesus was living for us before time began and right through for eternity... He wants to be seated with us on the throne of God so he can show us the riches of his kindness. We're not a side issue to God. Jesus from eternity past to eternity forward is living to intercede for us, to bless us, to show us his goodness. His whole existence is about us. All that Jesus is, all that he accomplished and all that he possesses is for us. In the Old Testament, his glory was in the temple, the Shekinah glory, and the priest couldn't even stand to minister sometimes. But these days, he indwells us by his Holy Spirit. He's given us his glory. And my goodness, we don't really think about it enough, I don't think. You know, we're not a side issue to God. just want to read... Uh, come back here. I think I'll read the, a bit more of Genesis, uh, John 17 because it's so good. I do not pray for these alone, which was his disciples, but for those who will believe on me through their word, which is us, we believe through the disciples' word, that they may all be one as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us and that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I have known you and these have known you that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. You can't argue that 
everything that the Father gave Jesus hasn't been given to us. He's poured himself into us. Isaiah 53, starting at verse 10, says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and put him to grief. When you made his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide with him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Verse 10 says, The Father was pleased to bruise Jesus and to put him to grief. Why? Because it says, While he put him to grief, he saw his seed. While Jesus was being beaten by the Roman soldiers, while he was on the cross, he saw us. And that because he saw us and he loved us so much, it pleased him what was done to Jesus. And that just, that just you can't get your head around that. Verse 11 says, The judge of all creation is satisfied with Jesus' suffering, with the sacrifice he made for me. The price of my justification is paid in full. We justified because he bore our iniquities on that cross. And it pleased God to see us. He see it. He loved him so much, loved us so much. Verse 12 says, He was made sin for us. He didn't just bear the sins of many, he was made sin for us. And for Jesus it was personal. I think I've mentioned before. Otherwise, 1 Peter 2. 24 says who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree it was personal to him and Hebrews 11 Hebrews 12 2 says for the joy of being in fellowship with us for the joy of this was set before him for the joy of being one with us by faith he went to the cross he gave all he poured out his soul unto death and was separated from the father and went to hell itself to make it so went to hell itself to redeem us so he could be in fellowship with us. God doesn't, God doesn't just love you. He is love. And he wrote 1 Corinthians 13, 7, which says, Love is a safe place to shelter, for it never stops believing the best of you. Love never takes failure as defeat. It never gives up. God is love, and because of that love, he put everything in the line, on the line for us. So great is his love for us that he gave Jesus that we might have abundant life. And that's the love that casts out fear. That's the love that activates our faith. That's the love that by which faith works. You can trust someone who loves you like that. If you don't know somebody, you can't really trust them. Some weeks ago I was looking for a book in a bookcase and I came across my old hang gliding log book. I started to read through the entries and dream and all the rest of it and came across an entry on the 5th of the 11th of 83 so I'm going to get into trouble here we must have been just engaged yeah <laughs> but I remember when we were married <laughs> so, but anyhow it, it says uh, two up flight with Kathy. we went down to Stanwell Park south of Sydney and I, it was a lovely day and I took her for a fly in my hang glider we flew around for a while and landed back down on the beach packed up and we didn't realise that one of Kathy's mum's friends, her Avon lady, was watching the flying. And 83 is the year before the first analogue phone network was installed by Telstra, so there was no mobile phones. And yet by the time Kathy got home, her mum knew all about it. <laughs> <laughs> and have you heard of, ever heard of not happy Jan? <laughs> Her mum didn't have faith that worked by love. <laughs> See, Kathy, Kathy trusted me, which was pretty big. <laughs> faith works by love. You can trust somebody when you know their love. And if you don't know them, you can't have genuine faith in them. You can't have genuine trust in them. How can you have faith, genuine faith in God's word without knowing God, knowing his character, knowing his love, knowing his faithfulness and his grace? But on the flip side, with a living revelation of, of who God is and how much he loves us, how can we not trust him? 
we get a revelation of God's love for us, how much he loves us as we are. And you can believe him. You can stand on his word. No wonder 1 Thessalonians 5.8 calls the breastplate that protects our heart the breastplate of faith and love. They're inseparable. We can trust him because he never changes. He never changes. And we've read about his love for us and his love just is unbelievable. It's unstoppable. It's unrelenting. It never changes. And when you go before him, to, whether it's to, to ask him for something, whether it's to stand for somebody, whatever it is to do, be aware of his love for you. Be aware of his love. Because someone who loves you like that is not going to hold back anything. He put it all on the line for us. He loved us that much. How can he be withholding anything from us? No wonder every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. No wonder he's not withholding any good thing from us. And just in closing, did we read one scripture that says his love is based on our goodness? Do we read any scriptures? Do we, have you ever read any scriptures that says it's based on what we do or don't do? No. Is God's love affected by our mistakes? Is God's love affected when we stuff up? Because we all manage to do that one way or another. His love's not affected. Love believes all things, hopes all things. God wrote that scripture. So his willingness to uphold his word for you and I is not affected by the mistakes we make. It's not affected by how good and how holy you happen to feel at the time. It's affected by his love for us, which never changes. Which by affected by his word for us, which, which never changes. His relationship with us, which never changes. So meditate on God's love for you till it becomes a revelation, till it comes alive and mixed with faith in your heart. It's one thing to know, know something in your head. We've preached on that lots of times. But get it down into your heart. Meditate on it. Think on it until it starts to come alive. That's how faith is activated. That's how faith works. And there will be a response. And that response will first be to love the Father. You just, just can't help but love him when you realise how much he loves us. And by that love, people will start to see that you've been with God, that you've been with Jesus. He'll start, people will start to see the love in you because it just pours out of you in a response to that genuine faith in the heart. The God kind of faith is founded on Jesus, the Word, who is love. And it works by love and its first evidence is love. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Ken. Let's just pray as we come to a close today. What a beautiful morning in His presence, hey? Our prayer most Sundays is that you would leave this place different to how you walked in that we have the faith that God has deposited in you the very things that you're going to need for the days, weeks, months, years ahead. And so thank you, Ken, for ministering how only you can. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for your love and your soul devotion to the creator of the universe. And thank you for the, uh, the little insight into, into your courting years. It's awesome to, to hear those stories. Do yourself a favour and get around this amazing couple. Mark and I had the privilege of having breakfast with them oh, two years ago probably now with Kathy and Ken and the stories and the testimonies. But do you know what's more impressive? It's, it was the God that came out through every word, every testimony, every story. So if, you wanna, if you're younger ones, that have been on the journey a little less, married couples a little less, go and have a chat to these guys. They've done long distance. They've done long distance before there was FaceTime and Skype and, and communication other than just faith. And Kathy's nodding her head, she's like, yep. But we, I'm so grateful for every single one of you, for what you contribute to this community. You're here for a reason. You're here for a purpose. And let's just pray as we leave this place, hey? Would you join the, Would you just whack a hand on the person next to you? We're gonna bless them today as well. Holy Spirit, we ask, 
that whatever it is that we were required to hear today, that it would be done. That we will have eyes to see and ears to hear what it is that you have said to us this day. Mighty God, we leave this place rejoicing. We leave this place because we've met with you, the living God, who is not dead and not an idol and not someone that that is awful and a tyrant. You are a God who cares. You are love itself. And so God, we leave this place filled with expectation, filled with faith, filled with love, filled with you, which is all of these things, Lord God. And we ask that the brother and sister to our left and to our right, God, get them real good today, we ask. Pour out your joy on them, we ask. Fill them up where they can't stop laughing. Fill them up where they got this weird grin and smile on their face that just, there's, the source has to be you. God, that there is an eternal hope and a confident assurance that despite what we see in the world right now, you are greater, you are stronger, you are more powerful, you have the answer. And so God, as we leave this place, we ask for your traveling mercies. We ask, Lord God, that we would have encounters with you this week in our day to day. We ask, Lord God, that you would bring people across our path that need to see you and to experience you and to be introduced to you. God, as we go about our day, our Monday to Saturday, we thank you that you care about those times too. What a privilege we have to gather together. So Lord, we ask that you'd pour out a blessing to our brother and sister to the left and to the right. God, that they cannot contain. Lord, we ask you'd fill them up to overflowing this morning with your goodness, with your mercy, with your loving kindness, with your peace. We ask, Lord God, that you would bless them beyond anything they can even handle, that they would just, they'd be in a position where they're like, stop, Lord, but don't stop. Bless them real good in every way. Relationships, health, prosperity financially, even with the traffic lights, Lord. Give us the green ones. We need the green ones. God, we worship you. We thank you that we can have fun in your presence, that we can have joy, unspeakable joy, that everything that is found in you is unmatched, unspeakable. You have no rival and you have no equal. And God, what an honour and a privilege it is that we have met with you today corporately. And God, as Ken reminded us, Father, you are in us. God, you never leave us and you never forsake us. We worship you in this place. And we all said, amen and amen. Stick around for a cup of tea if you can. Take someone to lunch if you want to. If you don't want to, then take them anyway. We we really appreciate you. If we can do anything for you, just connect with us during the week. If you need to know anything more about us, head to the info desk or reach out during the week. If you need prayer for anything, It'd be our honour to stand with you and pray if you have any needs today. Come out, grab someone in the foyer, do whatever it is, but don't leave without someone standing with you in faith this morning. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week.